Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. All right, so let's get started. We want to talk about the spirit of leadership, focusing on cultivating the attitudes that impact human action. That is another way of saying developing attitudes that make you a leader. I want to begin by talking about the power of attitude. Everybody say attitude. In our session yesterday and last night, I began to introduce to you what attitude is. I hope you wrote those down. I hope you will get a copy of the CDs and the DVDs and make sure, listen to them seven times over. You don't conceive a thing until you hear it seven times. And so make sure you get all these CDs, get the package from the conference, invest in that, and invest in your life. Now, what is the power of attitude? That's the first statement I want to make today is that there is nothing as powerful as attitude. I didn't realize that until I began to study why people don't change. There is nothing as powerful as attitude. Let me give you another thought to hang my hat on. Attitude dictates your response to the present and it determines the quality of your future. Your attitude is that through which you interpret the present. Whatever you're experiencing, you experience it through your attitude. But your attitude also controls your future. How many people have lost opportunities that could have made their future better because they had a bad attitude at the moment? Let me put it another way. You and your attitude is you. <laughs> you are your attitude. In essence, your attitude is you manifesting your true self. We're going to get into this a little deeper today. Point number four, if you do not control your attitude, then your attitude will control you. And in a real sad way, it's difficult to control your attitude. Because your attitude is a manifestation of your beliefs and your convictions. So you live out of your convictions and your beliefs. And that is why people don't progress in life, because their beliefs hold them back. Have you heard this before? It does not matter what happens to you. It matters what you do about what happens to you. And that is directly related to your attitude. Point number five, the power of attitude. Attitude creates your world and it designs your destiny. I have seen people right before my life as I watch them destroy their lives with their own attitudes. Give me a man with no education and a good attitude than a man with a PhD and a bad attitude. People get promoted in life not because of their education, but because of their attitude. Very important. To put it another way, Proverbs chapter 2 verse, chapter 23 rather, verse 7, Solomon understood this. Uh, of course, his father was David, so he understood this very well. Solomon says, and this is what I want to focus on for a couple of minutes, because this verse has been misquoted so often that we keep missing the point. Solomon never said, as a man thinketh, so is he. He never said that. 
We keep saying he said that, but he never said that. Solomon said, as a man think it in his heart, so is he. And the most important part of this sentence is not think. The most important part of this sentence is heart. Now I got to do a little bit of explanation here for you because we got to understand this. As a man think it in his heart, that's who he is. That's what he manifests. Write the word heart down, please. And let's clear it up now. When I did my research years ago, I mean, I was a young man when I figured this out because I wanted to know the truth. I always want to know what's the truth. What does God really mean? And I discovered with great amazement that the word heart has nothing to do with your chest. <laughs> now I say that because religion always makes you believe that when you use the term come into my heart, you are asking Christ to come into your chest. And that's what I thought too. I, that's what they taught me in Sunday school. They would even tell you to put your hands on your chest and pray. And Jesus Christ would enter your chest. No wonder why you never say, were saved nor were you changed. There's no place in your chest for him to stay. Your heart is a muscle that is controlled by impulses from the brain to pump blood. It's not a place of residence. So I had to try and figure out what does God mean? And the word heart here is the same word as mind. Everybody say mind. mind. But it is not just your mind as you think about it. It is, it, it is, how can you just find it? It is the below mind. Write that down, below mind. It doesn't make sense to us in English, but that's what it means. As a man thinks in his below mind, so is he. Now the word below, in our modern English translation, we use the word sub, S-U-B. So really, we're talking about what psychologists call your subconscious mind. Now your subconscious mind, the word sub means what? Below. That's why a submarine is called a below boat. <laughs> the boat that goes below the water. A submarine. Subconscious mind means you are not conscious of it. It's present, but it's below your conscious mind. It's your below conscious mind, which is more dangerous than your conscious mind. Now, Solomon says, as a man think it in his below mind, so is that man. So your subconscious mind, which we call your heart, sometimes the Bible calls it the seat of reasoning. That's where you store everything. This is very important. The heart is where you store everything that you've come to believe. You do not store your beliefs in your mind. You store your beliefs in your sub-mind. It's dangerous. And you store them there over a long period of time. That's why it's called conditioning. You condition your heart to accept certain things as being true and right and proper and acceptable. That's where you hide them. You put them where? In your subconscious mind, your heart. Now Solomon says, whatever you stored there, that's what you live out of. So even though your mind may receive 
new information. You could sit in a classroom for 10 years and get new information every day, but you will never change, because read it again, as a man thinking where? Not in his mind, but in his sub-mind. That's the man. So you are not going to become what you heard. You're going to become what you stored. And that's why you haven't changed yet. That's why reading positive thinking books don't change people. If it was able to change you, you'd have changed a long time ago. <laughs> We're going to read the scriptures in a minute to show you how the heart has been misunderstood. But let me give you just one preview. Jesus said, out of the heart comes the issues of life. You got issues? <laughs> you know where they come from? They are old problems. You started them there 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Let me give you a, a, a concept to understand the heart. The heart, see, the heart would be defined, if you was a computer, it would be called your hard drive. Your heart is the hard drive of your life. And that's where you download stuff and you keep them. Now, when you turn the computer on, you don't see them. People think you're okay. And most people get married to computers, not to hard drives. And when they get married, all of a sudden they press certain buttons. I'm going to leave that right there. That's how powerful the heart is. And that's why people don't become leaders. They read leadership books. They go to leadership seminars. They study leadership principles. They learn leadership techniques, leadership methods, leadership precepts, all this junk. And they come back and they are still lousy followers. Because it never was downloaded. And so they keep living out of their heart. You got two minds, remember that. You got the mind, and then you got the spirit of the mind. Ah. The word spirit of the mind, check it in the Bible, the word spirit there is a small s. You got the mind, and then you got the attitude of the mind. That's the one below. So when you ask Christ to come into your heart, you are asking him to come into your head. <laughs> the Bible says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Very simple. Download the word of God where? In his subconscious mind. And that doesn't happen when you read the sentence the first time. The Bible says, if you want to be successful in the kingdom, it tells you how. It says, meditate on the word of God. When? Day and night. Now the word meditate, write the word meditate down. Meditate. Everybody say meditate. The word meditate in the Bible is the same word as, write this down, C-U-D. What's spelling? C-U-D. C-U-D. One word. C-U-D. Get it? What is that word? Good. That's what the word meditate means in the Bible. Now, the, there are only certain animals that could. And this is the word that the Bible uses. It says, if you want to be successful in God's kingdom, you've got to meditate on the word. When? Day and night. Now, cutting is only done by a few animals. Cows cut, goats cut, sheep cut.
What is cutting? Here's how you cut. Study those animals, very important. Cutting is when the animal eats the fresh food, and then he's full. Then he goes under a tree, and he lays down. And he brings the food back up. See, every cutting animal, they say, has two stomachs. Cows have two stomachs. Sheep have two stomachs. Goats got two stomachs. One stomach is where you eat it up real fast. You eat it, get it in. So you get it stored in this first stomach. Then you find a quiet place under a tree and check the cutting animals. They always go off by themselves. And you'll see them all day just chewing. And you think they're chewing nothing. They are chewing when they ate. They regurgitate it, and they chew it again. And they chew it to the point where it assimilates into the second stomach and becomes a part of their whole body. Digestion. So they got a, a stomach, and then they got a below stomach. The Bible says if you want to be successful, you do that with the word of God. So you listen to me teach now. You're eating fresh food. He says, now when you leave here, get away from people. Find a hiding place. It might be your car. Every morning you put the CD in. And someone asks you, what are you doing? Just tell them. I ain't listening. I'm cutting. I already listened. <laughs> That's why you don't change. Because you only listen the first time. Here's the way Jesus said it. He said, let those who have ears to hear, that's fine, let them hear. He ain't finished yet. He says, and let these words sink down into your ear. That's the words he says. Download them, he says. It's not enough to listen. So the heart is your hard drive. Now you know how hard drives work in a computer, don't you? The computer comes with the hard drive. So you were born with a heart. <laughs> and the moment you were born, they started downloading. Yeah. And between age zero and nine, they told you what to download. You're stupid. You're ugly. You're black. You're white. You're retarded. You can't draw. You can't spell. You are second class. And they start downloading. They say that a, a, a child's mind is set by age seven. Good Lord. No wonder why when a baby is born in a kingdom, they take it away immediately from the mother and give it to tutors. Because they want that baby to get download of royalty immediately. <laughs> Most of us are kings, but we think like slaves. How many times have I heard people say this? We are king's kids. And they're broke, sick, divorced, frustrated, depressed, and they're king's kids. That's a contradiction. That's schizophrenia. <laughs> I'll tell you something. How do you know you were born with a hard drive that's supposed to have on it leadership download? I want to show you. I call this the creation of leaders. God did not create followers. 
Can I say it again? God did not create followers. God only created leaders. Here's where God created you. Genesis 1.26. Let's read it out loud. Read. Then God said. Who said? God said. Let us make a species called man in our own image and in our likeness. God is very clear of how this creature is supposed to be. He says, and here's why I'm going to make them. Let them have dominion over. He says, I'm going to create a ruler. I'm not creating a servant. I'm not creating a slave. I am creating a dominator. Yes. Let these children of mine have dominion over what? Fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock over the field, and over what? All the earth. God even specified what they were created to rule. And over all the creatures that creep upon the ground, over all the earth. So God is very clear. These offspring of mine will be dominators. They are designed to dominate, destined to rule. They are built and they have circuits of leadership. But they are not designed to rule one another. Look at the list. You are missing. Fish, birds, cattle, and creeps. First of all, you ain't got no feathers. Secondly, you ain't got no scales and fins. Thirdly, no roots growing out of your shoe. And fourthly, you don't walk on all fours. So you are disqualified for rulership. You are not to be ruled. Now, this is a very interesting experience here I'm going to get to. Therefore, in that order... And the word order in Hebrew is the same word as world. The Greek word is cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S. And it means order of arrangement, world. In that world, in that kingdom world, you don't rule people. I want to talk to my pastor friend over here, my cowboy friend. This I want to explain it to you. Listen carefully. Read the Bible. Don't read religion. God said, have dominion over everything except people. Which means that true leadership, true leadership, has nothing to do with people. Whew. The Chinese say, he that thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following is simply taking a walk. <laughs> I used to believe that until I studied Jesus. <laughs> you don't need followers to be a leader. You were created a leader. Ooh, I wish I had more days to be here. So much stuff going on in my head, I wish I could give it to you. But you cannot take it now. No, you can't take it. No. <laughs> you can't download it, right? You got to add some megabytes, yeah. That's good, I remember that. Yeah, some folks ain't got enough... Memory. Ah, that's it. Memory. Yeah. And 
some folks losing their memory too, anyhow. <laughs> so leadership in this kingdom is not a matter of oppressing people yes. or managing people. Yes. There's a book I want to recommend for you to read within the next seven days. And then write me a letter, tell me what you think. This book. The book is entitled, Becoming a Leader, Anyone Can Do It. It's the name of the title of the book. Everyone can do it. That means you, you must read this book. Housewife, read this book. Mechanic, read this book. Student, read this book. Because leadership is not for an elite few. Leadership is not for people who have been called. <laughs> That's Greek philosophy. He created an entire species of leaders, and he called them man. So you are, he's not king, and you are domestic servant. He's king and you are queen. But I got to download. I got to download. Otherwise, you think that you're just being called to cook. That's Greek thinking. I put it. Let me explain it to you. The word dominion. See that word dominion in that verse? I'm going to define it for you from the Greek and the Hebrew language. The word dominion, first of all, means to govern. Number two, it means to control. Number three, it means to rule. Number four, it means to master something. Very important word there. To dominate means to master. Number five, it means to lead. Powerful word. Let them have governorship. Let them have control. Let them have rulership. Let them have mastery over. Let them lead the fish, the birds, the cattle of the field, all the earth, all that creeps upon it, the whole planet. Let them master. You were created with all that stuff on the inside. Let me put it this way. You came with that, but you don't think like that. So you got, you got the equipment, but you don't have the mentality. The fall destroyed the mentality. So now we got a king thinking like a slave. So now you got a lion thinking like a sheep. And you've been born in a house of sheep thinkers. Your mama is a sheep thinker. Your daddy is a sheep thinker. Your teachers in school are sheep thinkers. And the curriculum is a sheep curriculum. And you got a sheep degree. <laughs> but you are a lion. That's the tragedy. And so you settle for less and you think you are succeeding. They make you proud of what God's ashamed of. <laughs> That's why I'm very cautious of people giving me awards. Because you'll be amazed how low their measurements are. <laughs> See, people are so average that if you do a little extra, they think you're a genius. 
And that's why you measure, you never measure your success by comparing yourself to other people. Because most of them, you're better than. <laughs> success is not measured by what you've done compared to what others have done. Success is measured by what you've done compared to what you know you should have done. Please buy the CD. Listen to it again. All of that is in you. Repeat after me. I am a leader. leader. Now, say this. I am a governor. I am a a controller. I am a a ruler. ruler. I'm a master. master. Say it again. I am a governor. I am a controller. I am a ruler. I am a master. That's what you are. Problem is, you don't think that way. And as a man think it, in his heart. No matter what he is, what he thinks is what he does. Help us, Lord. Hey, boy, say master. Now, I did a lot of research into this, so I, no, this, is not, I'm just, this is not just playing games with your mind. This stuff is real. What changed me is when I understood this. You've got to believe that at the belief level. <laughs> That's why you wouldn't change. You still think that you are supposed to get a job and pay bills. And according to God, you're supposed to master something. Tiger Woods has no job. Because true leaders have no jobs. I don't have a job. In this book, I wrote a chapter on the marks of a leader. And I made a statement in the book. Here's how I've written it. A true leader doesn't have a career because his life is a career. True leaders never retire. Why? You cannot retire from yourself. Oh, that's too much. Leaders don't do things. They are things. So Tiger Woods found a gift inside, and he mastered it. You were born to master something. See, I tell you, you and I, we know each other a long time. Went to school together. I was at, I was at your wedding and everything. We went, you know, we did a lot of things together. Have you ever sat down by yourself, Debbie? Just sat down by yourself. Forget Gary, everybody. Sat by yourself. And get quiet and just ask yourself, what am I known for? What do I master? And the answer is not quick and fast. You got work to do. Because your mastery is your area of leadership. Let me tell you how leadership works. This is how leadership works. A true leader never seeks followers. Why? They're too busy. Busy what? Mastering their gift. And when you master your gift, the followers find you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People pay money to fly to Georgia to walk up and up and down behind Tiger Woods. Spend hotel bill and everything. Cost them five thousand dollars for that week. Just to follow him up and down. Up and down. The guy is mastering a gift and they're looking for the gift. See? They come looking for the gift. They want to see the gift. 
And they're waiting for yours and can't find you. Because you are a jack of so many trades. Look at God's word. God says, let them master something. Every one of you was born in this room to dominate an area of gifting. Write it down. You were born to lead in an area of gifting. Everybody is. A true leader's job is to help all those who follow him or her to discover their gift and to provide an environment for them to exercise that gift and release that gift to bless the world so they can serve the world their gift. And according to Jesus, when you serve the world, your gift, you become great. Titles don't make you great. Service of your gift makes you great. Do you know why your battery is so important to you? Your battery doesn't say anything, does it? Doesn't talk. But your battery in your car so important to you. And you can always tell when it's missing. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way people are supposed to be in your organization. If they are gone and you don't miss them, then you are a defective leader because you did not develop them to contribute their gift to the organization. I will never forget why well, my time has gone so fast. I'll never forget when I heard this. This is, this is the story. <laughs> when I was understanding all of this stuff, man, I tell you, the Holy Spirit is so wonderful. Holy Spirit said, go back and read Moses. Moses is a good example to read about, you know, gifts. Here is God talking to Moses, Exodus chapter 4. Him and God are arguing, you know, arguing with each other, right? God's trying to convince him about who he is, and he's telling God who he's not. Okay? So they're having this discussion. So it gets to the point now where Moses insults God. How do you offend God? Very simple. And it's a shock to you. You, you don't offend God by telling God you cannot talk. You don't offend God by telling God, you know, give me proof. Or, you know, I put a fleece out or all this stuff. And put my hand in leprosy and take it out and heal it. No, God, God, God will work with you through all of that. He worked with you through all of that. He stayed, he's patient, he worked with you. He's still trying to convince you to believe in yourself, okay? What gets God hot is when you get to the point and you tell God, Send somebody else. Now that got God hot. It's very important now. You see, when you tell, when the product tells the manufacturer that you made the wrong product for this job, you are telling the manufacturer you are stupid. The Bible says the anger of God burned against Moses. Let me tell you something. God didn't make a mistake when he created you for what he created you to do. He built you for it, designed you for it. He gave you the personality for it. He gave you the color of skin for it. He gave you everything that you are required to have. He built you with it. The Bible says, how dare the potter say, pot say to the potter, why have you made me thus? 
when Moses told God, send someone else, God lost it. And that's when God took over the whole argument. And God did something that you charismatics can't handle. Follow me carefully, because we're going to go for lunch on this one. God said to Moses, listen, <laughs> Moses says, send someone else, because I cannot talk, and I cannot do this. And God's, God just stopped discussing, and he started commanding. He said, Moses, who makes men blind? Who makes men lame? Who makes men dumb? Is it not I that makes them that way? Now this is a deep statement. Because you see, most of you have been taught that the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There goes your charismatic teacher out of the window. How do you deal with that verse as a theologian? I'm going to write a book on this someday to help people understand it. I'm going to call the book The Benefits of Divine Defects. God says, every defect you have, I put it there. Now this gets deep now. He's dealing with leadership here. See, he says, look Moses. <laughs> he says, the reason why you cannot talk is because I pulled the plug before you was born. I made sure you came to earth with a defect. I made sure you couldn't talk. Why? Because your defect is someone's gift. It's too deep for you. God's deep now. He says, look. He says, therefore, go now. In other words, I ain't asking you to go no more. I'm commanding you. Get up and go get those people. Why? He explained it. He says, for even now, your brother, Aaron, is on his way to meet you. And he was born to talk. Lord have mercy. That's his gift. So if, if, I, if I lose your tongue, he would lose his job. Power of anointed, man. You got it. God set it up so that you cannot do everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Aaron's gift. He was born to talk. So God had to make sure Moses couldn't. Watch this now. He says, and when he sees you, you gotta read that verse again. It's a powerful verse. He says, and when he sees you, Moses, he will rejoice. You see, when he meets you, he'll finally identify why he could talk. Still don't understand what I'm talking about. So your defect is another man's gift. Your defect makes another man valuable. Because everybody is a leader in an area of gifting. God refused to heal Moses to protect Aaron. Wow. 
My God. What a wise master builder. So God make sure you can't type so you can have a secretary. <laughs> yes, sir. God make sure you can draw, not even a straight line, so you can have a graphics artist. God, make sure you got a penis so a vagina could be valuable. Not a rectum. I just thought I'd throw that in for good measure. <laughs> hey, boys, they praise the Lord. Yeah, get, say it again. Just say praise the Lord. That's right. Get over it real quick. Get over it real quick. <laughs> hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Yeah, my wife got a gift. Praise the Lord. I got one too. Praise Jesus. And you only give those gifts after you are married. I just thought I'd throw that in for these young people. Now, my point is, you were born to lead where? Well, in an area of gifting. That means everybody was born to master something. And your leadership is in your mastery. So stop trying to do everything. That will keep you poor. Stop being a handyman. And find something you're supposed to handle. I ask people, what do you do? I can do everything. No wonder why you're broke. <laughs> the reason why a doctor is very wealthy, he spent eight years plus another four in intern working on one thing. You keep changing jobs every six months. You wonder why you're poor. Some people don't stay one place long enough to master nothing. Keep changing churches. You know, keep changing ministries. Just bouncing around every new ministry they go after it, just moving around. They don't master nothing. They don't become known for anything. I believe God gives people churches, like, you know, ministries, to develop their gift. That's why God creates ministries. For you to have a place to go and develop your gift. And the best first step to developing your mastery is volunteer yourself. I'm going to say it again because some people still don't get this. I keep telling people, here's how you become great. First, you start by volunteer. Give your service free. There was a time when I never used to get paid for teaching people leadership. I used to just go, just never ask for money, nothing. Now they pay me plenty of money. $5,000 an hour. I did it free for 10 years. Your problem is you don't get paid the first time. And they don't know you. You ain't no master yet. There's a lady who I met in Mount Airy, New Jersey. She was in a seminar just like this, sitting now, now teaching on gifts and potential. Please get them book potential. Very good books on potential. And she caught that vision of potential I was teaching. And in the meeting, I said, some of you can bake good cakes and cookies. And it's your gift. But you wouldn't use your gift. And in the meeting, she came to me. She said, Dr. Monroe, please. I'd like to meet you. I'm Mr. So-and-so. I work in the hotel. I work as a maid in the hotel. I make beds. But I bake good cookies. And tomorrow I'm going to bring you some of my cookies. Because you spoke to me today. I'm reading that book on potential. I'm taking these tapes. 
What I heard today, I'm going to do. The next day she came to the meeting. Last night, she bought a bag of cookies for me. And, you know, I get gifts from all kinds of folks and all kinds of stuff. You know, people like me, we get all kinds of gifts. So I'm thinking, just another gift. Praise the Lord. Bless you. You know, thank you very much. And I went to the hotel that night. And when I was preparing to go to, to bed, I got a shower. And I talked to my wife. And I said, have cookies. Pass one of those cookies here. Let me just have a cookie. And when I bit into the cookie, I had an experience. <laughs> Matter of fact, I thought I had an orgasm or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Woo, them cookies were good, man. I said, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Woo, I said, what is in this cookie? Man, that was some cookie. She had dates, raisins, nuts. Figs. I mean, she, this, was, this was a cookie. A real cookie. I tell my wife, bring me another one, please. <laughs> and I said, this lady has a gift. But she's working in a hotel making beds. The next year, I went back to the same city, same building, same conference, to speak again. And on, when I arrived there, the limousine pulled up, security came, I came out, folks came around to greet me, and the security was keeping them away, that kind of thing. I don't know why, but that's what they do in America. <laughs> and uh, so this lady showed up in the crowd, and then I saw this, I, I didn't know who she was, this lady was standing there in a sharp suit. <laughs> Man, she looked like a mortal. She had on a nice hat, and she had this bag in her hand, beautiful bag. And she said, Dr. Monroe, I bought you a gift. I like gifts. So, she, so I said, let her through. That one, let her through. She got a gift. So she came in to meet me there at the car, and she says, I bought you a gift. And I got a story to tell you. I said, who are you, ma'am? She said, don't you know me? I said, no. She said, don't you remember me? I said, no. She says, uh, I'm the cookie lady. I said, oh, 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 give me the whole bag. <laughs> I want that experience again. <laughs> so she gave me this bag. And she says, look inside, Dr. Monroe. I opened the bag. She put her hand down, picked up. And there were these beautifully packaged cookies. I mean, manufactured package. She said, Dr. Monroe, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. She says, when you left, I followed your instructions, exactly what you told me. I read the three books on potential. I wrote down my dream and my vision. I accepted my cookie as a gift. And I began to bake cookies. She said, and I followed your example. Because I told her, I said, you know, what you do is you give it away free for us. She says, I bake, bake cookies. And I start giving it to my parents, my family. My cousins, my uncles, the folks who worked at the, at the hotel where I worked, you know, and, and everybody fell in love with my cookies, and they began to like them so much. They started asking me, can you make me a box? Can you make me some? She says, and I ended up with a kitchen. I had to buy another stove, and now I had to bake hundreds of cookies every month, every week. She says, and now I have a factory, 112 people working for me. I have a company. It's worth $1.8 million in one year. I'm a millionaire. And my cookies are being sold in Walmart, Kmart, all the big stores, distribution all over the city. She said, Dr. Monroe, I am in my gift. Yes. My God. My God. No more making beds. Cookies set her free. I wonder what your cookie is today. What do you do well? What gift did God give you that you're sitting on? And now she's a leader in the cookie business. Multi-millionaire now. When I was about to leave, she said, oh, just a minute, sir. I bought you something. She ran in a purse. I mean, she looked like a million dollars. Now, the first year when I saw her, she looked like a maid. Now she looked like, oh, classy. She went in this bag, give me an envelope. She says, I just want, this is a thank you note to tell you thanks for 
speaking into my life. I said, thank you very much. I went in, did the seminar that night, went back to my hotel room, opened the envelope, $10,000. So I told the folks the next day, any more cookie people around here? I want to help you make some cookies. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand for cookie people. What are you supposed to master? The Bible says a man's gift makes room for him in the world. The Bible says he that turneth his gift, it prospereth him. He that what? Turn it. Turn it. The Hebrew word means to refine. Like to shine something. He that refineth his gift, it will prosper him. You will never, ever, Become wealthy from your job. Your wealth is in your gift. Jobs are given to give you opportunity to develop your gift. So stop going to your work to become rich. I consider jobs a blessing. God gives you employment for them to pay you to develop your gift. So don't hate your job. Let them pay you to use your gift. And if they ain't using it, volunteer that area to them. And work overtime, it'll pay. Why? Because you ain't there for money. You're there for refinement. Because your day is coming when you will become valuable. So the cookie lady is one of my greatest supporters now. Since that I met so many cookies all over the world, like a cookie people, who sat in a meeting just like this, and they understood what I meant when I said discover your leadership and master your gift. And they developed businesses all over the world. There's a guy in Africa who sat in a meeting just like this, heard this very same session, and the guy on his job, he began to work on something after work, and developed a program, a calendar of positive thinking statements and all kind of positive stuff. He used all my books and developed everything. I mean, the guy didn't pay me royalty, you know, just developed everything. <laughs> but he got this calendar and all this stuff, developing all my quotes and everything. I mean, the guy is making millions. It's one of my partners now. South Africa. I wonder what you're sitting on. You ain't too old to find a gift. That's why you're still on earth. Amen. What are you master? My time is gone. Let's pray. Father, thank you. All things work together for us because we love you. We are called according to your purpose. I pray for those watching this program worldwide that you will discover God's purpose and his cookie for your life. May each one of you in this room find a quiet place today. Sit down in life and cut a little bit. May you chew what you heard again and again until it brings revelation that changes your thinking about yourself. It is my prayer that you would believe God's will for your life. Don't be afraid of your greatness. Embrace your greatness. And your greatness might be cookies. Not being the president of a country. Just cookies. 
But whatever your gift is, the world needs it. I pray that you will refine it and stop being normal. In the name of Jesus, I pray God's hand be upon you for good. For he says that he's not here to harm you. But Lord, you say that you are here to bring us to an expected end. There's something you expect from us. Take us to that expectation. For oh Lord, we are leaders in your kingdom. We were born not just to make a living, but to make a difference. Let this be our portion today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you once again for listening to this message, as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.